So now we're ready uh, to have questions, which uh, Becky Quick has selected from those that's been forwarded to her directly and from from Carol Loomis and Andrew Ross Sorkin and uh, Greg and I are available to be, uh, we'll be answering them uh, for some time. So Becky, uh, you're on and uh, uh, I hope, uh, I hope all the tech, I hope everything works. <laughs> Yeah, Warren, I should tell you that uh, since you put that address up on the screen, I've gotten more than 2,500 emails that have been coming in. So there is a lot of demand from shareholders wanting to get in and ask questions. And I'll, I'll ask some that uh, we've compiled before and some that are coming in right now. Uh, the first question, though, comes from one that just came in based on the comments that you were actually saying. Um, this is a question that comes from William Lewis. He said, please, did I understand correctly, Mr. Buffett, to say that Berkshire Hathaway sold its interests in four different airlines? And if so, can you name them? Can the names of those airlines be identified? Yeah, the, the, I, I wouldn't normally talk about it, but I think it, it, re, it requires an explanation. And, uh, uh, and it requires an explanation that means we were not disappointed at all in... Uh, the businesses that they were being run and the management, and, and, but we did come to a different opinion on it. And the, the four large, they're the four largest uh, U.S. airlines. It's American Airlines and Delta Airlines and Southwest Airlines and United Continental. And I think collectively they, they probably, uh, or at least 80 percent of the revenue passenger miles in the, in the. Uh, uh, it has flown in the United States, and, and they have significant uh, international uh, uh, flying, too, as, um, excluding Southwest. So we like those airlines, we like, but we, we don't I like the, the world has changed for the airlines, and I don't know how it's changed, and I hope it corrects itself uh, in a reasonably prompt way. I don't know whether the um, Americans will have now changed their habits or will change their habits because of of uh, an extended period if it happens that uh, we're semi shut down uh, in, the, in the economy. Uh, I don't know whether the trends toward, you know, what people have been doing by by phone. I mean, I've been, it's been seven weeks since I've had a haircut. It's seven, been seven weeks since I, more than seven weeks since I put on a tie or anything. I've been just a question of which sweatsuit I wear. So, who knows? Uh, who knows how we come out of this? But I think that there's certain industries, and unfortunately, I think that the airline industry, um, among others, that are really hurt by a a forced, in fact, shut down by events that are that far beyond their control. Greg, would you like to add anything to that? Really nothing to add, Warren. Okay. <laughs> well, we got another Charlie here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't intend Charlie. to use that as a line, but, uh, you know, you've covered it well. Yeah, Thank you. We would have bought other airlines, too, incidentally, but those were the four big ones, and that, those ones we could put some money into, and we put, we put whatever it was, seven or eight billion into it, and we did not take out anything like seven or eight billion, and that was my mistake. But it was, it's always a problem if it, uh uh, there, there are things on the lower levels of probabilities that happen sometimes, and, and it happened to the airlines, and, and I'm the one who made the decision. But, Warren, just to clarify on his question, he asked, did you sell oh, your whole stake I'm, in all four yeah, of those the companies? answer is yes. Yeah, when we, when we sell something, uh, we, right, when we sell something, very often, it's going to be our entire stake. I mean, we, we, we don't trim positions or that. That's just not the way we approach it. Any more than if we buy 100% of a business, we're going to sell it down to 90% or 80%. I mean, if we, if we like a business, we're going to buy as much of it as we can and keep it as long as we can. But when we change our mind... Right, the yeah, next go question. ahead, I'm sorry. <clears throat> No, go ahead. When you change your mind. Well, when when we change our mind, we don't we don't uh, take half measures or anything of the sort. So, I was amazed at how, frankly, now we sell, we were selling them at far lower prices than we paid, but I was amazed at the the volume. Their airlines always trade in in large volume relatively, but but we 
we, we have sold the entire positions. Okay, thank you. The next question comes from Robert Tomas from Toronto, Canada, and he says, Warren, why are you recommending listeners to buy now, yet you're not comfortable buying now as evidenced by your huge cash position? Well, A, as I explained, the position isn't that huge when I look at worst case possibilities. I would say that that there are things that I think are quite impossible, improbable, and I hope they don't happen, but that doesn't mean they won't happen. I mean, for example, in our insurance business, we could have the world's or the country's uh, number one hurricane that it's ever had, but that doesn't preclude the fact we could have the biggest earthquake a month later. So we 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 are not we don't prepare ourselves for a single problem. We prepare ourselves for problems that that sometimes create their own momentum. I mean, 2008 and nine, you didn't see all the problems the first day when. Uh, really what really kicked it off was when the the Freddie and Fannie, the GSEs, went into conservatorship in early September. And and then when uh, money market funds broke the buck, I mean, uh, there, there are there are things that trip other things. And, and we take a very much a worst case uh, scenario into mind that probably is a considerably worse case than than most people do so uh, I don't look at it as as huge and I'm not I'm not recommending that people buy stocks today or tomorrow or next week or next month I think it all depends on your circumstances but you shouldn't buy stocks unless you expect in my view you you expect to hold them for a very extended period and you are prepared financially and psychologically to hold them the same way you would hold a farm and never look at a quote and never uh, never pay it. You don't need to pay attention to them. I mean, the main thing to do, uh, and you're not going to pick the bottom and you're not going to, nobody else can pick it for you or anything of the sort. You've got to be prepared to, when you buy a stock, to have it go down 50% or more and be comfortable with it as long as you're comfortable with the holding. And I pointed out, uh, I think a year, maybe two years ago in the annual report, uh, well, just the one before this most recent one, I, I pointed out that there have been three times in Berkshire's history when the price of Berkshire stock went down 50%, three different times. Now, if you owed it on borrowed money, mm -hmm. you, you, know, you could have been cleaned out. Uh, there wasn't anything wrong with Berkshire uh, when those three times occurred. But if you're going to, if you're going to look at the price of the stock, uh, and think that you have to act because it's doing this or that, or somebody else tells you, well, I mean, you know, how can you stay with that when something else is going up or anything? You really, you've got to be in the right psychological position. And frankly, some people are not really careful. Some people are more subject to fear than than others. It's it it, it it's like it's like the virus. It strikes uh, some people with uh, much greater ferocity than 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 others, and and. Fear is uh, fear is something I've really never felt financially, but but uh, I don't think Charlie's felt it either. But, uh, some people can handle it psychologically. If you can't handle it psychologically, then you really shouldn't own stocks because you're going to buy and sell them at the wrong time. And you should not count on somebody else telling you that you should. You should do something you understand yourself. If you don't understand it yourself, you're going to be affected by the next person you talk to. And uh, uh, so you should you should be in a position to hold, and I don't know whether today is a, a great day to buy stocks. I know it will work out over 20 or 30 years. I don't know whether it'll work out over two years at all. I have no idea whether you'll be ahead or behind on a stock you buy on Monday morning or the market. Warren, the next question comes from Scott Kelly, and he writes in based on the numbers you just put up. He said, what did you spend the $426 million on equities in April? Was that adding to existing positions, or was that initiating new positions? Well, I don't remember, to tell you the truth, but, but one thing you have to allow for. <laughs> well, these are the <laughs> figures for Berkshire Hathaway, and they include both Todd, and, mm -hmm. Todd, uh, Todd Combs and Ted Wessler 
manage significant sums of money. So it could well be something they bought. It could be something uh, I bought. But I, I, uh, 462 million is not much money at, at Berkshire. It's more to Todd and Ted than it is uh, to me in terms of our positions. But I, I, I literally have no memory of, as I, we're not doing anything big, obviously. Uh, we're willing to do something very big. I mean, you could come to me on Monday morning with something that involved 30 or 40 billion or 50 billion dollars and and if we really liked what we were seeing we would do it and th that will happen someday if, if it happens in the market we can't put it all in in one day or one week or one month it took us months to build up our our airline position many months uh, we were able to sell them faster than we bought them but we were selling them at lower prices uh, so uh, the 462 is, is, is essentially meaningless and it may not have even, it probably was not mine. All right, this next question comes from Lee Yandar. Um, and his question is, in the last financial crisis, Berkshire acted as a lender of support for eight different deals. Despite the injection of expensive capital through preferred stocks and securing warrants, these companies were, in fact, paying for the sign of confidence from Berkshire in the midst of a crisis, and that was invaluable. Today, we have QE infinity, low interest rates, and hungry hedge funds. Uh, even though the economy has deteriorated rapidly over the last few, men, few months, why have we not acted as a lender of support yet? Well, we haven't seen anything attractive. Uh, uh, and fr frankly, uh, it wasn't predicated on this, but the Federal Reserve did the right thing, and they did it very promptly, which they should have, and I salute them for it, but that means that... Uh, that a lot of companies that needed money and probably should have done their financing a little earlier, but they're perfectly decent companies, got the chance to finance in huge ways in the last uh, five weeks or thereabouts. I mean, it's set records. Some companies have come back twice, a number of very big companies that didn't bother to, to uh, extend out their borrowings uh, came a couple times. Berkshire actually raised some more money. We don't we don't need it, but we'll, we'll I think it's still a good idea over time. And uh, and then there are some pretty marginal companies that have also had access to, to money. So there is no shortage of of funds at uh, rates which we would not invest at. Uh, so. It, we have not we have not done anything because uh, we don't see anything that attractive to do. Now that could change, you know, very quickly, or it may not change. Uh, but in 2008 and 9, the truth is, we weren't we weren't buying those things to make a statement to the world. They may have made a statement to the world to some extent, and I'm glad that they did if they did. But 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 we made them because they seemed intelligent things to do, and markets were such that we didn't really have much competition. Now, it turned out that we would have been a lot better off if we'd waited four or five months to do similar things. So my timing was actually terrible uh, in 2008 or 9, but, but the, what was available was so attractive that even though my timing was terrible, we still, we still came out okay, or, or a little bit better than okay. But it was not, it was not designed, we, what we did was not designed to make a statement it was designed to, to take advantage of what we thought were very attractive terms, but they were terms that nobody else was willing to offer at that time because the market was in a state of panic. And the market in equities was in a state of panic for a short period of time when the virus broke out at, or spread in the United States, and that became apparent. And the debt market was frozen, or in the process of freezing, and... That changed dramatically when the Fed acted, but who knows what happens next week or next month or next year. The Fed doesn't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and nobody knows. Uh, there's various, there's a lot of different scenarios that can play out. And uh, under some scenarios, we'll spend a lot of money, and other scenarios, we won't. Greg, you've been watching what's been happening around Berkshire. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I think your comment on the on the Fed, Warren, because as you know, 
Interestingly, when it was first occurring, there were calls coming in, not the size of transactions we're interested in, nor companies we were inclined to act upon. But there were there was that general interest out there as people were um, in a difficult point in time, i.e. looking at their balance sheet and deciding what they were going to do. But the reality is those companies were not of not not of interest and post basically effectively March 23rd, the companies have been able to act and and Warren touched on it at Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Uh, post the Fed action, we actually issued $4 billion of, of securities that was associated with some um, debts or obligations we had maturing, some short-term obligations we wanted to clearly lengthen out. And we pre-funded one of our capital programs at Pacific Corp with the thought this was the time to get the, the funds in place such that we could proceed with uh, what is really an excellent opportunity both for Pacific Corp, our customers, and ultimately for the Berkshire shareholders. So we've taken action within Berkshire, as, as Warren noted. This is a very good time to borrow money, uh, which means it may not be such a great time to lend money, but the... Uh, uh, it's good for the country that it's a good, it's, it's a good time to borrow money. <clears throat> Not good for Berkshire, particularly. Although we <laughs> we borrowed some money, so yeah. we we uh, we've uh, we put our money where our mouth is. That gets kind of to another question that came in from Mark McNicholas in Chicago, Illinois. He says Berkshire itself has a Fort Knox-like balance sheet, but some of its operating companies may be tight on cash during the pandemic. Uh, would Berkshire consider sending cash to its operating companies to, one, ensure that they can get through the pandemic, and, and two, uh, allow them to increase market share while their competitors struggle? Well, we've sent money to a few, and, and uh, uh, we're in a position to do that. We're not going to send money indefinitely to anything where it looks like uh, their future uh, is not, has just changed dramatically from what it was a year or so ago, or even six months ago, you know, we made that decision in terms of the airline business. We took money out of the business, basically, at a, even at a substantial loss. And we will not fund a company that uh, where we think that it's going to chew up money in the in the future. We started out with a company like that in our textile business at Berkshire Hathaway in 1965, and we went for 20 years trying to think we could solve something that wasn't that solvable. So. Uh, we are not in the business of subsidizing uh, any companies with shareholders' money if people want to do that with their own money, but we're not going to do it on their behalf. But we have advanced money. We, we're, we're perfectly ready to advance money. Gaining market share and all that, that may happen, but, but uh, the companies that, that need money probably... Uh, Market share is not their number one problem, I'll put it that way. <laughs> Greg, would you? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting when we look at our different companies as we went into the pandemic or we're addressing the COVID-19 crisis, obviously the first focus by our management team and appropriately was our employees and, and, and effectively making sure they're safe and that the business environment we're in that, that they could continue to operate. Then we quickly moved to looking at uh, where our customers were in this cycle, i.e. what was the underlying demand within the business. And, and to great credit to our managers, they very much have adjusted their businesses consistent with the underlying needs and demands of our of, of our customers. So effectively, they're moving with the, with the customer, meaning very few of our businesses have actually required funds. Some have, and as Warren said, uh, we've advanced the funds to them, but the the businesses have really reacted in a way where they're managing consistent with the with uh, where the market's at, i.e., their the demand for their products. Um, Berkshire is almost certain to generate cash. I mean, at, at uh, nothing's 100 percent certain, but but and we're as Greg mentioned at, at Berkshire Hathaway Energy, we had some short term. Financing. We, we don't have short-term financing at, at any degree. We'll never get ourselves in a position where we have a lot of money that can come due tomorrow. And and uh, 
people that were financing uh, heavily with commercial paper and then found their business stopped. Well, you've seen what's happened to the airlines. I mean, they need money. Uh, cruise lines need money. Uh, there's some businesses that, uh, you know, it's just the nature of uh, what they're in. And, uh, Berkshire will never get it in a position where it, uh, it, it needs money. But, uh, uh, and, and we factor in, like I say, we, we factor in some things that are not ridiculously unlikely. Uh, and I'm not going to spell out scenarios because I, to some extent, if you start spe spurring, is, is, is spelling out scenarios, you may increase the chance of them happening. So it's not something that we really want to talk about a lot. But, but our, uh, our position will be to be uh, to stay at Fort Knox, but we don't need it. No, we don't need a hundred and it's a little higher now than it was at quarter end. We don't need 130 or 35 billion, but we need a lot of money that's always available. And that means we own nothing but treasury bills. I mean, we do not, we've never owned, we never buy commercial paper. We don't buy, we don't count on bank lines. Uh, you know, one or two of our subsidiaries, have, a few of our subsidiaries have them, but they, we, we, we basically want to be in a position to get through anything. And, and we hope we, that doesn't happen, but you can't rule out the possibility any more than in 1929, you could rule out the possibility that, that, uh, you know, you would be waiting until 1955 or the end of 1954 to get even. And, uh, anything can happen, and, and we want to be prepared for anything. But we also want to do big things. If the prices are attractive, as, as Greg said, there was a period right before the Fed Act, and we were starting to get calls. They weren't attractive calls, but we were getting calls, and... The companies we were getting calls from after the Fed acted, a number of them were able to get money in the public market, uh, frankly, at terms that we wouldn't have given it to them. All right, this next question is one that, uh, Greg, you actually touched on uh, the answer to this to the, to some extent, but maybe the two of you could expand on it. It comes from Richard Surser from Tucson, Arizona. He says, Berkshire's annual report indicated that Berkshire had 391,539 employees at the end of 2019. Which areas of our operations have already been hardest hit or will be by the coronavirus pandemic, and what are the implications for the continued employment of those people? Uh, those those people are employed in dozens and dozens of different industries, and there's there are a few industries that there's a a fair likelihood that our employment uh, could be reduced, but they're not large. Uh, I'm just thinking as I'm talking. I mean, it's not like it's not like we're uh, you know in, in the uh, 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 some of the businesses that are, you know, we're not in the hotel business or uh, various aspects of travel and entertainment and all of that that could really be changed in a very major way. So I, I don't, I don't see our employment. I, I, I'll put it this way: five years from now, I think Berkshire will be employing considerably more people, and and uh, I don't, I don't see where we'll have large dips, but. The virus could take off in certain ways that in some of our manufacturing businesses, for example, the demand could be dramatically reduced. And in those cases, we would have, we would have uh, layoffs at some, at some point. Greg? What I would add, Warren, is that as we are in the you know, sort of crux of the, the pandemic, we're still dealing with it, so our businesses have adjusted. Some have had to adjust more. We have, if you look at uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy, for example, you can see U.S. electricity consumptions down 4%. That realistically doesn't impact that business in a significant way, and, and longer term will continue to grow that business. So even, in, even during the crisis, uh, a relatively small impact of the business. But as Warren knows, we do have retailers that their doors are shut right now, be it uh, our seized candy, 
the some of our jewelers and at that point in time we 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 do adjust and adapt to the environment i.e. we adjust our workforce but equally we do see for example sees at a point our stores will reopen and at that point we re-employ the folks and overall for Berkshire as a whole as Warren said five years from now we see our employment numbers being far 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 greater than they were are today and that we see great prospects within the uh, the operating businesses as a whole. Yeah, Seas is an interesting example because yeah. we've, we've owned that since 1972. That's a long time, and we love it, and we continue to love it. And, and I have a box here of our peanut brittle, and I've got another box of fudge right here, and I'll probably take them all home and not share with Greg. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, But we were in the midst of our Easter season, and Easter is a big uh, sales period for C's, and I don't know whether we were halfway through, but we weren't halfway through in terms of the volume that's going to be delivered because it comes right. toward the end. And uh, essentially, we were we were shut down, and uh, we remain shut down. The malls that we've got 220 or so retail stores, and we've got a lot of. Uh, 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 you know, when Furniture Mart sells our candy, but the Furniture Mart's closed down. And so yep. C's business stopped. And uh, it's a very seasonal business to start with. So we have a lot of seasonal workers, too, that come in, particularly for the Christmas season. But but we have we have a lot of Easter candy. I mean, <laughs> and and uh, it, Easter candy's kind of specialized, too. So we won't sell it. And... and we produced a good bit of it, and we couldn't ship it, and we couldn't uh, we couldn't put it in stores, and and there's some of that's going on, and of course I, Greg does all the work on those sort of situations, and our managers are terrific, of course, in in, in, in dealing with it, but but this is a very very unusual period, and like I say, a few years from now, I think Berkshire will be employing more people than 395,000. Over the years, we've we started with 2,000 of the textile business, and and we still got the same playbook. It's, it's this next question comes from Drew Johnson, who says that he's a longtime shareholder who's attended a couple of meetings. He says in an interview on April 17th, Charlie mentioned that some small businesses owned by Berkshire would not reopen after the pandemic eases. Can you elaborate on which businesses might be impacted? Well, even we have businesses within businesses at Marmon, don't we have 97 different businesses, for example? Exactly, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and there are some that uh, uh, weren't doing that well before. I'm, and I'm not talking about Marmon specifically, but they got a couple of them, and there's a couple of and And uh, it may be that, that in effect, uh, the... the you know what's happened in the last couple of months has accelerated the decline and of those businesses or their customers are developing different habits i mean people are developing different habits in retail there's no question about that now that doesn't mean we're we haven't got a bunch of good retail businesses but uh there are there are businesses that were that were having problems before and that have even greater problems now we don't own our newspapers anymore, but we're financing uh, Lee Enterprise, which does have them. We've actually increased our investment in the newspaper business by, by selling the papers to Lee and then refinancing their debt. And the newspaper business was having plenty of problems with both circulation and advertising before the virus came along, but advertising declines every place have accelerated uh, fairly dramatically. And you know, when the automobile industry stops, you know, the auto dealers don't advertise as much. It's 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 made certain businesses that were tough before even tougher now, and uh, there will be and the management of of, of uh, at least one of the subsidiaries has suggested to us, and so there'll be but there'll be there'll be some changes at a few businesses but they're they're very small businesses uh, our major businesses uh and our business of intermediate size i can't think of anything that, that that's of significance that that uh 
uh, won't won't reopen. Uh, but it won't be any fun with the the businesses where the world has really changed. You're seeing a lot of change. Uh, if you own a shopping center, uh, uh, you've got a bunch of tenants that don't want to pay you right now. We don't, and uh, uh, you know the supply and demand for retail space may change fairly significantly. The, the supply and demand for office space may change significantly. A lot of people have learned that they can work at home or that uh, there's other methods uh, of conducting their business than they might have thought that the, uh, from what they were doing in, a couple of years ago. And when change happens uh, in the world, um, you adjust to it. Yeah, I think the... Oh, uh, go ahead. Question. Becky, I think, I think Greg won. Yeah. Oh, well, sorry, I was just going to add ahead, on Greg. the Marmon example, our 97 companies there. For example, we have a food service group which sells equipment to a variety of the restaurants. Uh, we have a few businesses that realistically were challenged when the industry was performing really well. And as we come out of the you know, crisis, their, their economic prospects aren't going to be better. And, and in fairness to the teams and the employees in there, they understand that and they're working through it and there'll be other opportunities potentially within the company, within Marmon and things like that. But, you know, there's a very specific answer or example relative to the, to the question. This next question is a follow-up on that. It comes from Chris Freed of Philadelphia. And he says, it's been a long-term policy of Berkshire to not sell or close any ongoing subsidiaries as long as their business prospects weren't a money hole. Over the last year, he points out the, the sale of Berkshire Hathaway Media uh, and then Charlie's comments from that interview saying that several small Berkshire sub subsidiary subsidiaries will not be opening when the coronavirus lockdown is lifted. So should sh shareholders assume that Berkshire has now changed its long-term policy in regards to keeping underperforming su subsidiaries no, no, around? I think, I think that policy was spelled out for maybe 30 years or so in a in the den, uh, to the in the annual report that we have said that that if a company or if an operation, uh, we think it, it's, it, it, its prospects uh, are that it will continually uh, lose money in the future, that uh, we will certainly, uh, we'll try to sell it to somebody else, uh, but one way or another, we will, we will not continue to, to hold it. And that, that is not a new policy and it's not been changed. You can say, in effect, we did that with the airline industry to some extent. But, uh, if we owned all of an airline now, it would be a tough decision to decide whether to sustain billions of dollars in operating losses when you know, A, you don't know how long it's going to happen or occur, and secondly, you know that it's very likely that there'll be too many planes around uh, and we know what happens in airline pricing when load factors go down and, 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 and uh, there's an oversupply of airline seats. So, you know, we didn't have to make that decision in terms of our own operation on it, but, but we did make a decision that, that that's a very tough management decision to make. And the government, of course, is, is uh, well, they've had the first wave of financing for the airlines, but to the airlines credit, they have very aggressively uh, raised money. I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how, what a good job they've done of that. And, and in the case of, uh, I think in the case of three of them, uh, no, two of them, but there may be more coming, that they've raised equity money too. I mean, they are, they are saying to the, the debt holders and investors, you know, You've got to put more money into this business uh, if we're going to be able to continue. And the government's done it, and uh, and private sources have done it, and it's going to it, – it's exactly the right thing for the managements to be doing. Uh, but, you know, whether it's – whether it makes sense, we'll find out for the investors. This next question comes from Eric LaFont, and it's directed to Greg. He asks, 
How is Precision Cast Parts handling the severe slowdown in the aerospace industry? So very consistent with everything we've just discussed, which is uh, obviously a large part of their business is the aerospace industry. Uh, and it can really be broken into three areas as we do in our queue, but two are being impacted. The defense contract business remains very sound and strong within precision cast parts. But if you look at the uh, uh, large body aircraft, the aircraft that they use within the regional jets, that business will move directly with the demand there and, and the jets that are ordered longer term. So precision cast parts is... Uh, literally as we speak, continuing to adjust their business relative to the demand that would come out of Boeing. They would be having weekly calls with Boeing, recognizing what are the production orders there and, and adjusting the business uh, accordingly. Yep. Boeing raised $25 billion just a day or two yeah. ago, and they raised $14 billion before that, and a year ago they felt they were in a fine cash position, and I understand how all that happened. Airbus has had the same situation. They've made some comments recently within the last week, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, they, they they really don't know what their future is. I, and I don't know what their future is. I We're going to, we, they, we're going to have aircraft in this country. We're going to be flying. But the real question is whether you, you need a lot of new planes or not, and, and when you'll, when you're likely to need them, and, and, uh, it affects a lot of people, and it certainly affects precision cash parts. It affects mm -hmm. General Electric. It except, you know, obviously affects Boeing, and and uh, it uh, it's it's it is a blow to essentially have your demand dry up, <laughs> and it goes up in the chain, and uh, uh, you know the. The aircraft manufacturers didn't, they didn't bring it on themselves. The airlines didn't bring it on themselves. Precision cast parts didn't bring it on themselves. General Electric didn't. It's basically that we shut off air travel uh, in this country. And what that does to people's habits, how they behave in the future, it's just hard to evaluate. I don't know the answer. And, uh, but we do know that it will have an effect mm -hmm. on precision cast parts. And it... it how severe it will be it depends on the same sort of variables that are hitting Boeing and, and, and you name the company in, in aircrafts and aircraft's a big business and the, this country's good at it incidentally too I mean if you think about Boeing you know it is what a hell of a company and and it's 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 important it's a huge exporter and and, and uh, uh, affects a lot of jobs uh, and some of them are with us and you know we hope for the best and we wish everybody the best obviously and, and we wish ourselves the best in it but part of it is out of our certainly out of our control right. this next question is for Warren and um, do you think Geico will experience unusually high profitability in 2020 due to the reduced amount of driving, even after giving customers a 15% credit? Well, we have promised to give our customers at Geico. We're the second largest auto insurance company, and and different auto insurers are handling a sharing of the of the better experience with their policyholders in different ways. We our plan will deliver back two and a half billion roughly or so in, in recognizing uh, the reduced uh, frequency of accidents during this period. What we don't know is how long this will continue. I mean, people want to drive their cars still, but uh, conditions have reduced that driving dramatically, obviously. Now, we have instituted a program that runs saving people money for six months, and, and, and so far, other people have largely been two months, but some of them have given a little more. For those two months than, than we give per month, our total is the greatest uh, uh, at, at two and a half billion. And uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, we and all the others in the industry, it's not just GEICO, we've also, uh, and insurance commissioners in many cases, I believe, have required it, but we have 
uh, we, we give people more time to pay if they aren't paying. And if they cancel their policy or if they don't end up paying us, we've in effect giving them, giving them free insurance during that period. And, and the delay in payments is obviously increased. Delay of payments on, if you got a shopping center getting rent, if the delay in payments is what happens during a period like this. Uh, and that will be a significant cost to us. We don't know how significant will be. There will be more uninsured motorists, motorists driving, and they cause a disproportionate amount of accidents. And that, so there's a lot of variables. We made our best guess as to uh, what we're going to do to reflect the current reduced accidents in our in our in, uh, in our premiums that we receive. Really over. The next year, it applies for a six-month on renewals, but that we'll be renewing policies in October that will extend it then next April. And so we've made a guess on it, and and uh, we'll see how it works out. This next question comes from Steven Stoller. He's a shareholder in Atlanta, Georgia, and he says, would you please help us understand the effects of COVID-19 on our insurance businesses? Other insurance companies have reported losses from boosting reserves for future insurance claims that they expect to be paying as a result of coronavirus. Yet in Berkshire's 10Q released this morning, we do not appear to have reported much of these future expected losses. Can you tell us why this is the case? What kind of risks Berkshire is underwriting that allows us not to be affected by the pandemic? Or conversely, what, what we are writing that might be? Well, the the amount of litigation that is going to be generated out of what's already happened, let alone what may happen, is going to be huge. Now, just the cost of defending litigation is a huge, enormous expense, uh, depending on how much there is. Now, in the auto insurance field, which is our number one field in terms of pre premium volume by some margin, uh, that's more definable, uh, but who knows what comes out of it in terms of litigation. But, but in what they call commercial multiple peril, which involves property losses, and where some people elect to buy business interruption uh, coverage, uh, many policies quite clearly in the contract uh, language would not have a claim for business interruption under a commercial multiple policy where you've elected that. But other policies do. I've, uh, I, know of, I think I know of one company, I don't know the details, that's written a fair amount where they cover, or they, certainly there's a good argument perhaps that they cover uh, uh, business interruption that might arise from a pandemic. Well, they're in a very different position than the standard language, which says that you recover for business interruption only if there's uh, involves physical damage to the property. And you can you can buy all kinds of different policies. We are not big in the commercial multiple peril business. So, I mean, this is not like our auto business or anything of the sort. But we will have, we will have claims, we'll have litigation costs, uh, but proportionally, it's not the same with us as with some other companies which uh, have been much heavier in writing business interruption as part of a commercial multiple peril. But you don't automatically get coverage if you have business interruption. I mean, for example, uh, I think it would be unusual if, say, General Motors had a strike, which they did, and that they have business interruption that covers the strike. Now, uh, we actually wrote about, probably the only annual report in the United States, we wrote about business interruption insurance because we, we had it over in France when one of our properties was adjacent to a property that's much smaller property that had a fire and then it spread to our plant. and. It caused a lot of physical damage, and we have bought it. we have business interruption that ties in with that. 
But if we had some company we were selling auto parts to and they had a strike, our business would be interrupted. But it's not covered by the, I mean, that is not part of the coverage unless you specifically really buy it. So there's, there's some claims that are going to be very valid related to this, uh, uh, the, the present situation. There'll be an awful lot that there'll be litigation on that won't be valid. And it, there's no question that some insurance companies, I know one in particular, that uh, will pay a lot of money relative to their size uh, in terms of policies that they've written. And, and uh, I think we have reserved, and our history shows we generally have reserved that on the conservative side adequately at least. And, and that's, that's certainly our intent. And we tell no managers of any of our insurance operations what numbers we expect from them or do any of that. That uh, They evaluate their losses and they build in something for social inflation. They build in things for you know, uh, all kinds of things. And generally speaking, uh, Berkshire's been pretty uh, pretty accurate in its reserving, and I, I have no reason to think that we're otherwise than that uh, currently. Stephen Tedder from Atlanta, who says he's a 10-year Berkshire shareholder, writes in and he says, do you see Berkshire offering pandemic coverage in future insurance policies? Well, the answer is we, we, we insure a lot of things. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, I don't... We... We had... Somebody come to us the other day wanting insurance uh, involving a $10 billion uh, protection on something very unusual. Uh, we're not going to make that deal in all probability. I, in fact, I would say it's dead. But we would have written, we would have written pandemic insurance if people had come to us and offered us what we thought was the right price, we would have been wrong uh, probably in doing it. But uh, we, we have no reluctance to quote on very unusual things and very big limits. We're famous for it. We haven't done that much of it in certain periods because the prices aren't right. But uh, if you want to come and insure almost anything uh, and... We don't want you to insure against fire if you happen to be a known arsonist or something. But but if you come to us with any unusual coverages, either in size or in the nature of what's covered, Berkshire is a very good place to stop. And and uh, so somebody wants to buy, they they can dream up the coverage and they can tell us the price they'll pay and and uh, uh, we we will we'll consider writing it. We wrote a lot of business after 9-11, for example, and there were really only a couple companies in the world that were willing to write the business. And Berkshire and AIG uh, wrote a lot of business, and we thought we knew what we were doing, but we could have been surprised. I mean, there could have been some follow-on incidents from 9-11 that, that we wouldn't have known about. And, you, know, you don't know for sure the answer. That's why people are buying insurance. But we wouldn't. We would be willing to write pandemic uh, coverage at the right price. This next question is for Greg, and it comes from a shareholder named Todd Flaska. He says, "I don't expect Berkshire to outperform the S&P 500 during good times. However, I remain a long-term investor because of the huge war chest that can be deployed during the downturns in the market, like we're seeing right now." Warren has been brilliant at negotiating mutually favorable deals with companies that have somewhat urgent capital needs during these downtimes. These opportunities may only come about once a decade. There's a small window of time for these deals. They all come at once, and you don't really know if you're at the bottom of the market when the deals start coming. Will Berkshire be able to continue this approach when Warren and Charlie are no longer at the helm? I, I fundamentally... With, without Warren and Charlie at the helm. I don't see the culture of Berkshire changing. I don't see our billet, which a large part of that is uh, uh, having the business acumen to understand the, the transaction, the economic prospects, and then the ability, to, the ability to act quickly. I really don't see that changing as we evolve. Listen, you know, there's 
no one better than Warren and Charlie, but equally, we've got a talented team in Berkshire, uh, both at the Berkshire level and within our, our managers that can obviously look at opportunities too very quickly. But, you know, the reality is it's a huge uh, advantage we have right now when we would clearly want to uh, be in a position to maintain that that uh, that position of strength. Warren? Yeah, we will maintain it. And, and, and we not only have it with the managers of the, in some cases, uh, not, not all cases by a long shot, but in some cases we have um, uh, managers that will occasionally come up with something that can, can be quite attractive. Uh, but between Greg and Todd and Ted, we've got three extraordinarily good minds in terms of allocating capital. And, and uh, you know, I, Charlie may get, we may get an occasional call of, because of someone we knew 20 years ago or something, but they know a lot more people. They've got a lot more energy and their minds work the same way as ours have in the past. So I, uh, I think it could very well be a significant improvement when the three of them are thinking about capital allocation than when Charlie and I are now, particularly now that he's found Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this next question comes from Max Rudolph in Omaha, Nebraska, and he asks if Berkshire or any of its fully owned businesses have participated in any of the bailouts from the Fed or the Treasury. I certainly don't know of any. I guess you could say while we own the airlines, uh, uh, well, you know, the question is about fully owned businesses, I, and there's no way yeah. that I wouldn't know about anybody that... Did any of that, Greg? Uh, no. In fact, uh, uh, we've been very clear with the with the businesses, but we our, our businesses understood our uh, how Berkshire operates, and equally, we we're very clear that we would not be participating in any of those programs or, or quote bailouts. This is a similarly related question. It comes from Seth Frieden, who says, as a long-term shareholder of Berkshire B shares, would like to know Warren's viewpoint around smaller holdings, specifically Oriental Trading Company and Nebraska Furniture Mart that are based in your hometown of Omaha. Uh, he imagines that those smaller business units have been adversely impacted by COVID shelter-in-place mandates. So would like to know if Oriental Trading or other small business units applied for PPP loans or participated in those acts and if they didn't qualify for a loan or didn't participate, then how will Berkshire support those smaller businesses to make sure that they can continue to employ uh, their employees? Yeah, well, to my knowledge, I, I, and none of them have um, gone in for government money. And uh, uh, the, the two that are mentioned, I don't like to get into specific companies, but I can, I can assure you that the Nebraska Furniture Mart and Oriole Trading, in my view, have a fine future. But I, 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 I don't want to talk about, go down the list, obviously, of every single company, because some of them I don't know the answer to. Uh, you know, we actually decided some time ago that, that our newspapers would have a much better chance of surviving if they were run as part of Lee than if we ran them independently. And and as I said earlier, we actually put considerably more money, we probably put more money in the newspaper business than virtually anybody in the country uh, in the last uh, six months because we took over a loan that would have been a problem in the year, whatever it might have been, maybe a year and a half. And uh, we enabled them to just deal with one lender rather than a group, and they are doing a better job with the newspapers than we would do, and that's always our preference if we've got a business that's that does not have look, looks like it is not going to uh, uh, sustain itself over time in our hands. If we can find somebody else that we think will do a better job, we'd we'd love to have them uh, run it. Uh, so uh, if we have a problem business, uh, we would. 
prefer to find somebody that thinks they can do a better job and probably can do a better job of running it than we can. But some businesses just disappear. We, we started with the textile business. We started a company called Diversified Retailing, which merged into Berkshire, became part of Berkshire, and, and uh, it started with a department store in Baltimore. And department stores looked good in 1966, but the world has gone against them. And we had a trading stamp business at one time, and, uh, and we stayed longer than anybody else, but you know, the world left trading stamps behind. Or, uh, and that's going to happen with some businesses. That's capitalism. Uh, and it will happen to some Berkshire businesses over the next 10 years, in the next 50 years. We think we'll find more of them that will grow and, and net that Berkshire will grow. But we do not think, if you own a great many businesses, that everyone is destined for success. That's why I suggest to people they buy an index fund. I do not, with the exception of Berkshire, I, I would not want to put all my money in any one company, although there's a few I wouldn't mind being very close to that. But uh, I don't think, you know, you get surprises in this world and uh, there will be businesses that we think are very good that turn out not to be so good and there will be other businesses that turn out better than we think and and uh, and it's up to the world to judge our batting average over time. Greg? Yeah. Well, I, I would just add and echo again that when it comes to the PPP loans, we're not aware of any of our businesses taking them and, and you know, as I said, we encouraged them if they were ever thinking that there was going to be a dialogue and we're not aware of any businesses pursuing them. I would also just add that when you look at our businesses as we went into the crisis, they responded very well. So as we look at our businesses, and Warren touched on this, our large businesses, our mid-sized businesses, and even as you go down from there, they're, they're in uh, very sound shape as we go through the pandemic and are really preparing to emerge now. So they're evaluating listen, they're going to have a different customer. There's going to be different consumer behaviors. How our employees work. Uh, I, a lot of them work at home now. Does that make sense? And the communities we're operating in have all changed, but we're literally moving from the point of, okay, we're, 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 we're making it through the crisis and really planning to reemerge now. And I would say our businesses are in an extremely sound place. We don't know when the uh, this next question. Well, I was just going to say, but we don't know. We don't. We don't. We don't know how long this period lasts, uh, and no, and nobody knows. Uh, you know, we don't know whether the most people think, and they know more about it than I do, that the virus will, you know, to some extent, uh, uh, decline in its spread and during summer months. And I would say a good many think uh, that it will come back at some later date. And how the American public reacts if they get their hopes up uh, through some reopening, some through, uh, through some summer diminution, and how they would react to a second attack in effect by the virus. It's like Dr. Foss, you know, the virus is going to determine our behavior. You know, we, and, and we're doing a lot of smart things and we've got a lot of very smart people, but there are unknowns and the unknowns that apply to the health aspect create unknowns in the economy. And uh, uh, we will we'll have to keep evaluating things as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope, like crazy obviously, that, that, uh, that once suppressed, that, it doesn't come back and that, that we readjust, but things don't always work perfectly. That doesn't mean there was a better course of action. It would not, I would not go around criticizing people at all for what they've done or anything of the sort. I just think you're dealing with a huge unknown and I think that the degree to which it's disturbed the world and changed habits and endangered businesses in the last couple of months indicates that you better be not be too sure of yourself about what will what it'll do in the next six months or year or whatever well 
Warren, a moment ago you mentioned that you still are recommending that people invest in an S&P 500 index fund. Um, let me ask this question that came in from Kevin. He says, the last few weeks we've been hearing from active money managers that the day of passing in passive investing is over. The historical safety of investing in an index fund long term is gone. Would you please provide your thoughts on this topic, particularly in regards to an investment time span of 10 years? Well, I can tell you I haven't changed my will, and it, it, it directs that my, my widow would uh, have 90 percent of the funds in index funds, and it's, it's, I think it's better advice than people are generally getting from people that are getting paid a lot to give other advice. You don't make a lot of money advising an S&P 500 index fund. I mean, that, and, and, uh, how you can say the day, day of index funds is over. I mean, you're, if, you, if you say the, the day of investing in America is over, I would disagree quite violently. And then is there something special about index funds being a terrible way to invest? Uh, I just don't think, they're, they're really it's very hard to have evidence of that. I mean, it's, if, if the index funds reflect the market uh, uh, and one side has high fees that, uh, that think they can pick out stocks uh, and the other side has low fees, I know which side's gonna win over time. And it's, you have to recognize that it's in, in a great many people's interest to convince you that they can do something that they may well even believe they can. And a certain percentage of them will do it from luck and a few people will do it from skill. And that's what makes it so enticing that you can find the Jim Simons or somebody that's going to produce extraordinary return. Uh, and uh, Jim and his group have done it by, by brain power. But it's very unusual. And incidentally, they are going to charge you a lot of money and they're going to actually maybe close up their fund uh, if they do it because they can't do it with really huge amounts of money compared to what they've, how the record's been established in the past. So it's, you, know, you just have to recognize you're dealing with an industry where it pays to be a great salesperson and it pays even better if you're a great salesperson and you can actually produce something, but, but the money is in selling. The, the, there's a lot more money in selling than, than in managing actually if you look to the essence of investment management. I got a number of variations on this next question, some more polite than others. This one's right about down the middle. Uh, but this is from Mark Blakely, who writes in from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he says, like many, I'm a proud Berkshire Hathaway shareholder. However, in comparing the performance of Berkshire with the S&P 500 over the last 5, 10, or 15 years, I've been disappointed in Berkshire's underperformance. Even year to date, Berkshire is trailing the S&P 500 by 8%. To what would you attribute Berkshire's underperformance? Well, I can't imagine ever selling my Berkshire stock. At some point, money is money. <laughs> well, I, I agree with everything that, uh, I forget his name, but said. I mean, the, uh, the truth is that that's, I recommend the S&P 500 to people. And I happen to believe that Berkshire uh, is as, about as sound as any single investment can be. Uh, in, in terms of uh, earning reasonable returns over time, but I, I would not want to bet my life on whether we beat the S&P 500 over the next 10 years. I think there's, a, you know, I obviously think there's a reasonable chance of doing it, but, and we've had periods, I don't know how many out of the 50, 55 years we've been doing it or at, uh, uh, I don't know how many we've beaten or not. I, I mentioned earlier that 1954 was my best year, but uh, but I was working with absolutely with peanuts, unfortunately. And and I think if you work with small sums of money, I think there is some chances, some chance of a few of people that really do bring something to the game. But I think it's very very hard for anybody to identify them. And I think that when they work with large funds, it gets tougher. And uh, it's certainly gotten tougher with for us with larger funds, and I would make no promise to anybody that we will do better than the S&P 500, but I, what I will promise them is that I've got 99% of my money in Berkshire, and most members of my family are 
may not be quite that extreme, but they're close to it. And I do care about what happens to Berkshire uh, over the long period about as much as anybody could care about it. Uh, but, you know, caring doesn't guarantee results. It does guarantee attention. But, uh, Greg? Well, I, I would agree, one that there's never guarantees, but when I, I look at the uh, assets we have in place and the teams that are in place, i.e., you're committed to Berkshire, but we have dedicated teams that uh, equally are dedicated to Berkshire, and they're sure going to give it their their best effort every day. And I, when I look at the assets and the people, I think we have, a, as you said, a, a, you can't guarantee it, but we have a, a great chance of, of, of sure giving a good effort to help perform it. It's hard to imagine getting a terrible result with Berkshire, well, but, but, you know, anything yeah. can happen. And what I do know is it would be easier to be running... Five million, then, then our book net worth at Berkshire at the quarter end, I think, was 370 some billion, which is down, but it's still greater than the book net worth of any corporation in the United States. That's uh, probably, I mean, maybe there's some federal corporation that has more, but in terms of it, may, and it may be the greatest in the world, I'm not sure. When I would and that, add, that, make, that makes life difficult in some ways, too. <laughs> right. And, and the potential of our operating businesses are substantial. When you think we've talked about energy, you touched on it, that that infrastructure is continuing to change. There's, you know, we're ready for $100 billion of investment opportunities there. If we just look at the business over the next 10 years and the infrastructure that's required and how it's changing, substantial, substantial investments there that just tell me we have very good prospects it's it's uh and we're well positioned to 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 pursue them um which again to me when you look at our core businesses you touched on them burlington the insurance and 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 energy it's tough our, our downside is very nicely protected we have three really core great businesses yeah and we're better positioned than anybody in the energy business that, that yeah. just because we don't have dividend requirements. We've retained 28 billion of earnings over 20 years. That, that you can't do it if you run a, a normal public company. And we've got a huge appetite, and the and the country needs it. Uh, the world needs it, and uh, we are a very very logical, uh, well structured, well managed. I would say because it doesn't involve me, uh, company. To participate uh, in just huge requirements around the world. Now, you know, they're slow and they involve governments and they, they I mean, then, you know, state governments. And there's a lot of, it's not anything that happens dramatically. It will happen. And, and Berkshire should participate in a huge way. We can do things in insurance nobody else can do. Uh, that doesn't mean much at many times, but. Occasionally, it may be important. Uh, so, so there are there are some advantages to size and strength, but there are disadvantages to size too. If if we find a, some great opportunity that for a billion dollars to double our money, that's a billion pre-tax, and that's that's 790 million after-tax, and on a market value of 450 billion or whatever it may be. It, it doesn't amount to much, unfortunately. We'll still try and do it if we can. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Warner. <laughs> uh, I want to ask this question that came in because I think some people may have had a misinterpretation about something you said a few minutes ago. This is the benefit of being able to get these questions real time. Uh, but a few moments ago, you were talking about the people uh, at the company who will be allocating capital after you and uh, Charlie are no longer doing it. And you mentioned that you've got Todd, Ted, and Greg all doing that. But I've, I've gotten a few questions that read similar to this. This one's from Edward Papula in New York City, who says, Dear Warren, I noticed you didn't mention Ajit Jain when you reeled off your list of future management. Is he out of the picture? Well, Ajit is not in the capital allocation business. He is the best. Well, he's got one of the best minds in the world. I mean, I wrote his father after he worked for... I was for a few, year, a few years, I wrote up again the other day, but 20 years ago I wrote up and I said, if you've got another son like this, send him, send him over from India because you know, we'll own the world. Then. Now, Ajit is one of a kind. Anybody will tell you that's had any contact with him 
and particularly anybody in the insurance business where they know him well, he is absolutely one of a kind. But his job is not capital allocation. It's, it's evaluating insurance risks, and that is a rare – he possesses a rare talent, and he has – a, a huge capital backing uh, to do it. So we, he's an incredible asset. But Greg and Todd and Ted have been in the asset allocation business in a big way for a long time. That's their game, and the Jeet's game is insurance. So that's why I mentioned those three. And incidentally, while Charlie and I are around, we kind of like capital allocation ourselves. So <laughs> we're not going anyplace voluntarily, but we probably will go some, someplace involuntarily before that long. <laughs> Charlie's in good health, incidentally. I'm in good health. <laughs> um, Greg, let me ask you one of these capital allocation questions. Uh, this one comes from Matt Leibel. And he says, Berkshire directed 46% of capital expenditure in 2019 to Berkshire Hathaway Energy. Can you walk us through with round numbers how you think differences in CapEx spending versus economic depreciation versus gap depreciation and help explain the time frame over which we should recognize the, contract, uh, the contracted return on equity from these large investments as we, are shareholders in, uh, as, we as shareholders are making in Ber Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway Energy? Right. So... When we look at Berkshire Hathaway Energy and their capital programs, we try to really look at look at it as 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 it was highlighted, really in a couple different uh, packages. One, what does it actually require to maintain the existing assets for the next 10, 20, 30 years? I.e., it's not incremental; it's effectively maintaining the asset, the reflection of depreciation. And, and our goal is always to clearly understand across our businesses, do we have businesses that require more than our depreciation or equal or less? And happy to say with the assets we have in place and how we've maintained the energy assets, we generally look at our depreciation as being more than adequate if we deploy it back into capital to maintain the uh, asset. Now, the unique thing in, in the lion's share of our energy businesses that are, are regulated, uh, and that exceeds 85% of them, 83% of them, uh, we still earn on that capital we deploy back into that business. So it's not a, um, a, a traditional model where you're putting it in, but you're effectively putting it in to maintain your existing earnings stream. So it's not drastically different, but we do earn on that capital. But what we do spend a lot of time, and that's what, when, Re when Warren and I think about the substantial amounts of opportunities, that, that's incremental capital that is truly needed within uh, new opportunities. So it's, build, it's to build incremental wind, incremental uh, transmission, that services the wind or, or other types of renewable solar. That's all incremental to the business and drives incremental both growth in the business. It does require capital, but it does drive growth uh, within the energy business. So there's really the, the two buckets. I think we would use a number a little bit lower than the depreciation. We're comfortable the business can be maintained at that level. And as we deploy amounts above that, we really do view that as, quote, uh, incremental or growth capex. Yeah, we have what, what, forty billion or something. Of, uh, what, what do we have in sort of kind of in the works? Oh yeah. yeah. So so we have basically, as Warren's highlighting, forty billion in the works uh, of capital. That's over the next effectively nine years, ten year period. A little, uh, approximately half of that we would view as maintaining our assets. More, a little more than half of it's truly incremental, but and that are known. Those are known projects we're going to move forward with, and I would be happy to report we probably have another thirty million, thirty billion that aren't far off of becoming real opportunities in that business. Now, as Warren said, that takes a lot of time. It's a lot of work. The transmission projects, for example, we're finishing in 2020. Were initiated in 2008 when we bought Pacific Corp. I remember working on that transmission plan, putting it together, thinking six to eight years from now we'll we'll have them in operation. Twelve years later, and and over that period of time, we we earn on that capital we have invested, and then when it comes into service, we earn on the whole amount. So we're very pleased with the opportunity. But it it we plant a lot of seeds. Put it that way. Yeah, and 
these are not, it's not like they're super high return thing, but they're, they're decent returns and, and uh, over time. And, and uh, we're almost uniquely situated to deploy the capital uh, as opposed, I mean, uh, you, you could have government entities do it too, but, but in terms of the private enterprise. And uh, they take a long time. They earn decent returns. I've always said about the energy business, it's not, it's not a way to get real rich, but it's a way to stay real rich. And, and uh, uh, we will deploy a lot, a lot of money at decent returns, not super returns. It, and you shouldn't earn super returns on that sort of thing. I mean, it, 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 it does, you are getting rights to do certain things that governmental authorities are authorizing and, and they, they should protect consumers, and, but they also should protect uh, people that put up the capital. Uh, and, you know, it's worked now for 20 years and it's got a long runway ahead. All right, this next question comes from Jason in New Jersey. As both a Berkshire and Occidental shareholder, I was encouraged to see your investment in the company. But with passing weeks, it became evident that your investment facilitated Ox uh, Occidental management's ability to avoid a shareholder vote on the Anadarko acquisition, a very shareholder unfriendly outcome. This deal proved to be irresponsible and expensive from an Oxy perspective and ultimately very value destructive for Oxy shareholders. In my view, it also permanently hurt Berkshire's reputation in the marketplace. Please comment on this unfortunate outcome and tell me why Oxy shareholders and other market observers shouldn't feel this way. Well, the, uh, we said right from the beginning, although we didn't certainly expect to agree to it, uh, what's happened. We, we said essentially when you buy into an oil, a, a huge oil production company, uh, you know, how it works out is going to depend on the price of oil to a great extent. It, it's not going to be your geological home runs or, or, or super mistakes or anything like that. It, 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 it is a, it is a investment that depends on the price of oil. And, you know, the, I, when oil goes to minus thirty-seven dollars, <laughs> it's happened the other day for, for I guess it was the May contract. Uh, you know that's off the chart, and and if you, if you own oil, you should only own oil uh, if you expect these prices uh, to go up significantly. I don't know whether they'll go up significantly or not. We're in the we're in the transaction. Our commitment uh, was made on a Sunday uh, when the management of Anadarko favored Chevron. And Chevron had a breakup fee of a billion dollars, and and Occidental people have been working on it for several years, uh, and it was attractive at oil prices that then prevailed, and it it doesn't work obviously. Uh, it doesn't work at twenty dollars a barrel certainly doesn't work in minus $37 a barrel, but it doesn't work at $20 a barrel. And everything the oil companies have been doing, whether it's Exxon or Occidental or anybody else, it doesn't work uh, at these oil prices. That's why oil production is going to go down a lot uh, uh, in the next few years because it does not pay the drill. Now, that's happened at other times in the past, uh, but the situation is... You know, you don't know where you're going, going to store the incremental barrel of oil, and oil demand is down dramatically. And and for a while, the Russians and the Saudis were trying to outdo each other in how much oil they could produce. And when you've got too much in storage, it doesn't work its way off that very fast. Now, you will have production of oil go down in the United States significantly. It does not pay to drill in all kinds of formations that it, it, it paid before and it doesn't pay it doesn't pay to have paid the price that oil was trading at in the ground a year or two ago and uh, and to that extent if you're an oxy shareholder you know you've or any shareholder in any oil producing company uh, 
you join me in having made a mistake so far in terms of of where oil prices uh, went, and who knows where they go in the future. Let me follow up with this one, then. This one comes in from Manish Bal, who says, is there a risk of permanent loss of capital in the oil equity investment? Well, there certainly is. You know, there's no question. If, if oil stays at these prices, there's going to be a lot of money, a whole lot of money, and it'll extend to bank loans, and it'll affect the banking industry to some degree. Not that it doesn't, doesn't destroy them or anything, but it, there's a lot of money that's been invested that was not invested based on a... $17 or $20 or $25 price for for WTI, West Texas Intermediate Oil. and uh, uh, But you can do the same thing in copper. You, know, you can do the same thing in, in some of the things we manufacture. I mean, it, it but with commodities, it's particularly dramatic. And, uh, you know, farmers have been getting lousy prices, but to some extent, the government subsidizes them. I'm all for it, actually. Uh, uh, I'm uh, but if you're an oil producer, you take your chances on future prices, unless you want to sell a lot of futures forward. Oxy actually did sell 300,000 barrels a day uh, of uh, puts, in effect, that, uh, or they, they, they bought puts but, and sold uh, calls, in effect, to match it. And they were protected on at $10 for a layer of $10 uh, a barrel on 300,000 barrels a day uh but you're really buying when you buy oil you're betting on oil prices over time and and uh over a long time uh and oil prices uh, there's there's risk and and the risk is being realized by oil producers as we speak uh there will be if these prices prevail there will be a lot of bad loans and energy loans and and if, or, or bad debts and energy loans. And if there are bad debts and energy loans, you can imagine what happens to the equity holders. So yes, there's risk. All right, this question comes from Bob Coleman. Um, he says, Warren, could you bring us up to date with the status of your equity put contracts? Sourcing the 2019 annual yeah. report uh, found on page 60, it appears at 2019 year end, the fair value liability was just under a billion dollars. And if the index has declined 30 percent, the liability obligations ballooned to 2.7 billion dollars. So if the indexes are down 60 percent, would Berkshire's obligation be close to five and a half billion dollars? Does that math seem reasonable? And are there any loose ends or open exposures associated with no, the No, they, 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 we... Between 2004, I think, and 2006, I think we wrote 48, maybe 50 contracts, something like that. The, the shortest was 15 years. The longest was 20 years. And we received, as I remember, roughly $4.8 billion, which we were free to do with what we wanted. And we agreed uh, to pay based on where one or more of four indices uh, were selling for at the time of expiration. They were so-called European-style puts where they're only payable based on one date. And we did not have, with a small exception, we did not have to put up collateral, which uh, was part of the deal. And we've had that $4.8 billion. Uh, we probably had an original nominal value of something over 30 billion maybe 35 billion that's if everything went to zero uh i mean if dow jones went to zero the FTSE went to zero and the nikkei and so on um a number of those have run off so we now have about 14 billion nominal we have something less than half left we haven't paid out anything significant we bought back a few of them um if everything went to zero, we would owe $14 billion. If everything were to sell at the same price it was selling for on March 31st, uh, I think the number uh, is some, I think it's somewhat less than we carry as a liability on the balance sheet, which is two and a fraction billion. So, so far, so good. I mean, we've had 
the use of a lot of money and the outstanding potential of them is if the market went up a lot, we wouldn't have to pay anything. And if it goes down some more, we have to pay more than a couple of billion, but we've got the liability set up for that. But so far, so good on, on that. And it is not anything that causes us any problem. They come due, the final one I think comes due sometime in, in 2023. Uh, I think there's, uh, I think maybe 20 or 25 percent of them come due late this year, and uh, so it's the there's nothing that the questioner doesn't really understand about them. I can tell by the question, and and there's no surprises there. There's there's no way that some liability could double up on us, except based on uh, except relating to where those indices close at the expiration of a group of different puts, which, like I say, have been more than cut in half. And we've done very well on it. Hmm. Key to that. Uh, Warren, you mentioned a few minutes ago that well, you... Well, I was just going to say, oh, go key ahead. to that ahead, was, with just a couple of tiny exceptions, we did not we did not agree to put up collateral. We never would have gotten ourselves in that position. And uh, th that was when we made the deals. We uh, We just would not get ourselves in that position, and we never never will, uh, where, where on a given date, we could have some tremendous obligation that, that would come due that we weren't count on getting, uh, uh, having come due. I'm done then, Becky, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that you're very concerned about Berkshire's long-term health too. This question came in from Drew Estes in Atlanta, Georgia, who says, there's already speculation of a post-Buffett breakup of Berkshire, and given the sway carried by modern activists, the speculation should be taken seriously. Many long-term owners see the folly in this view. A $25 billion ancillary earnings stream provides a lot of flexibility when investing insurance float. On our and your estate's behalf, could you more forcefully make the case of maintaining Berkshire's current architecture? If you don't, that responsibility will fall on an unknown set of shoulders with far less credibility. Well, if you were to... If you were to sell Berkshire's various subsidiaries, uh, you would incur a very significant amount of tax at the corporate level before anything was distrib distributed to the uh, shareholders. Uh, you can spin off a given one or something of the sort, but the ability to break up a diverse uh, company without tax implications there was there was something called the general utilities uh, doctrine that prevailed in various ways up until 1986 and a lot of people seem to comment based on the fact that uh, that didn't happen in 1986 and there's imaginative ways where people try to avoid taxes and can do it in some cases uh, on certain types of transactions if you were to break up Berkshire uh, that would be one factor, but the interaction of being able to move capital around in terms of being able to do things in insurance that we couldn't do unless there were the backup earnings and capital employed in the other entities, there's, there's enormous uh, advantages in capital deployment uh, within the place. So I, uh, there is not a big discount to break up value uh, embodied in Berkshire's price. And the situation actually is that although all my Berkshire shares, every share, will be given to charities pursuant to a plan I developed back 14 years ago uh, and followed ever since and will continue following this July of the giving away $3 billion or so worth of the stock. And But it's all, it's still... It involves uh, a big voting percentage that, including other people that still remain in the picture, aside even from from the Buffett family, uh, it it isn't going to happen. Now I will tell you, everybody in the world will come around and propose something and say it's wonderful for shareholders. And by the way, it involves huge huge fees. I mean, that you do not. 
you do not get impartial advice from Wall Street when there when there's uh, enormous amount of of fees possible from one action and no fees applicable from another action. But uh, you can you can be sure I've thought about it, and I would say that you can you can count on Berkshire's present posture being continued for a, a long time. I can't tell you what's going to happen a hundred years from now, and. Uh, and I can't tell you exactly what would happen, for example, if, 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 if certain ideas in terms of wealth taxes changed or taxes on foundations changed. I mean, they're But my plan has been thought out and in place for a long time. And it not only ensures that the money that's been made off Berkshire, all of it ends up going to various philanthropies staggered over time, but it also... It, 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 it will keep the wolves away. Greg, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I, I think the comment on the, the capital allocation is critical, that we have the ability to move the capital amongst the, be it the operating businesses or up to the insurance or down, uh, with really no consequences to our shareholders. That's uh, the value driver, the unique structure of Berkshire, and it creates immense value. So. That's all I would add, or, or second, I guess. <clears throat> all right, this question comes from Rob Grandish in Washington, D.C. He says, interest rates are negative in much of Europe, also in Japan. Warren has written many times that the value of Berkshire's insurance companies derived from the fact that pol policyholders pay up front, creating insurance float, on which Berkshire gets to earn interest. If interest rates are negative, then collecting money up front will be costly rather than profitable. If interest rates are negative, then the insurance float is no longer a benefit but a liability. Can you please discuss how Berkshire's insurance companies would respond if interest rates became negative in the United States? Well, they were going to be negative for a long time. Uh, you better you better own equities, or you better own something other than 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 that. I mean, it. it it's remarkable what's happened in the last 10 years. I've been wrong in thinking that that you could uh, really have the developments you've had uh, without inflation taking hold. But uh, we have 120 odd billion. Well, we have some almost very high percentage in treasury bills, some in other, and some just in cash. But we. But those treasury bills are paying us virtually nothing. Now, they're a terrible investment over time. But they are the one thing that when opportunity arises, it will arise at a time and maybe the only thing you can look to to pay for those opportunities is the treasury bills you have. I mean, the rest of the world may have stopped. And we also need them to protect, be sure that we can pay the liabilities we have in terms of policyholders over time. And we take that very seriously. Uh, so... If the world turns into a world where you can issue more and more money and have negative interest rates over time, uh, I'd have to see it to believe it. But I've seen a little bit of it. I've been surprised. So I, I've been wrong so far. Uh, I do not think that uh, uh, I don't see how you can uh, create uh, I would say this, if you can have negative interest rates and pour out money and incur more and more debt relative to productive capacity, you'd think the world would have discovered it in the first couple thousand years rather than just coming on it now. But we will see. It's, a, it's, one of the mo it's probably the most interesting question I've ever seen in economics is, is, uh, is uh, can you keep doing what we're doing now? And, and uh, we've been able to do it, or the world's been able to do it for now a dozen years or so. And but we're we may be facing a we may be facing a period where we're testing that hypothesis that you can continue it uh, with a lot more force than we've tested it before. Greg, do you have any thoughts on that? I wish I knew the answer. Maybe you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I, I think. Uh... As you, as you articulated, I think it was in the annual report, too. I mean, the, we don't know the answer. Um, but uh, as you said, some of the fundamentals right now are very interesting relative to having a, a negative interest rate. But uh, no, 
I, I hate to say it, but I don't have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to be Secretary of the Treasury if I knew I could keep raising money at negative interest rates. That, that makes life pretty simple. It, uh, uh, it, we're doing things that we really don't know the ultimate outcome. I think, and I think in general they're the right things, but I don't think they're without consequences. And I think they could be kind of extreme consequences if pushed far enough, but... but there would be kind of extreme consequences if we didn't do it as well. So somebody has, yeah. has to ma you know, balance those 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 questions. All right, this question comes from Adam Schwartz in Miami, Florida. He says Berkshire is the largest holding in his partnership, which also houses most of their net worth. Um, he says Berkshire's invested in many capital intensive businesses through the years, railroads as an example. How do you think about the inflationary or even deflationary risks for all of the capital intensive businesses? And could this prove to be an existential problem for businesses? Kind of referencing what you were just talking about that eventually the bill for the debts being issued comes due. Will it eventually come from all businesses through some combination of higher tax rates on corporations, increased wages for, for the lower middle class? Yeah, well, I certainly think that increased corporate taxes are a much higher probability than having lower corporate taxes. So I I think that we got handed as a corporation a big chunk of what used to be the government's profits from our business a couple of years ago. And uh, it would depend on, to some extent, which party is elected and, and uh, whether they have control of both houses as well as the presidency and who knows what else. But uh, uh, we could very easily have higher corporate income taxes and perhaps much higher corporate income taxes at some point. And uh, in terms of capital-intensive businesses, they're just not as good if you can find an equally good business. <laughs> I mean, in terms of operations, that doesn't require capital. I mean, they're, you know, the uh, C's never, C's never re Required capital it didn't grow, but it's, but it's, it's, it just doesn't. It didn't take money to expand it, and it, it delivered enormous sums to us. And because we own it within Berkshire, to redeploy it elsewhere didn't require a lot of tax expense either at the corporate level or at the personal level. Uh, uh, so you really want a business. And everybody wants a business that doesn't take any capital to speak of and keeps growing and doesn't take more capital as it grows. Now, our utility business, our energy business requires more capital as it grows. Our railroad business, to some extent, requires more capital if it doesn't grow even. Uh, so capital-intensive businesses, uh, by their nature, uh, you know, are not as good as something where people pay in advance and you don't need the capital. I mean, if you look at if you look at where the top market value is in a $30 trillion market, you know, if you take the top four or five companies that account for, you know, maybe three, four trillion of, or so of that 30 trillion, basically they don't take much capital. And, and that's why they're worth a lot of money because they make a lot of money and they don't require the money to any great extent in the business. We own some businesses like that. But it's certainly not the railroad, and it's not, it's not the uh, energy business. Uh, they're good businesses. We love them. But uh, if they didn't take any capital, they'd be unbelievable. But, they're good. but that's just uh, that's uh, what we've learned from 50 or 60 years of operating businesses, that if you can find a great business that doesn't require capital when it grows, you've really got something. And to a certain extent, because... Insurance uses the kind of assets we would like to own anyway. Our insurance business doesn't really take capital. It requires having capital available, but we're able to invest that money largely in things we'd like to own anyway. So we're particularly well-suited for the insurance business, and it's really been the most important factor in our growth over the years, although a lot of other things contribute.
Greg, you're you're in the capital. You were in the capital intensive business. A yeah. long time. Tell us about it. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, there's no question. Obviously, we'd prefer to be in a less capital intensive business, but there are unique opportunities there. And I, the one I would touch on when I think of inflation, or even potentially uh, as we go through this. Uh, uh, crisis and, and maybe a prolonged one or how, depending on how long it takes to recover. I mean, we are in a unique, when we're looking at energy or rail, we do have a certain amount of pricing power. And, and it's through our regulatory formulas or, or how our arrangements are with our customers. So if we then were to move into an inflationary period, uh, it's not perfect protection, but those businesses... Uh, generally re can recover a significant portion of their costs, even in an inflationary environment, and still earn a, uh, a reasonable return. They're not going to be great returns, as you highlighted, Warren, but they're still going to earn a reasonable oh, yeah. return yeah. on their capital, even in uh, an inflationary period. There may be some lag and some things like that, but they're still going to be very sound investments. So. Oh, yeah. If there was 10 for 1 inflation, make it extreme. Yeah. Well, We'd be happy we own the railroad. Yeah. Very happy. Uh, uh, well, we'd be investing a lot of capital in it, but but that business is, in my view, is a very, very solid business for many, 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 many decades to come. I said originally we bought it with a 100-year time horizon, and I've extended that. So uh, it, it will earn more dollars if there's a lot of inflation. Uh, in real terms, who knows? But but it would it would earn a lot more dollars, and and a lot of the energy projects would. And the, but uh, but it's better if we don't have inflation, and it's better if we don't have capital. <laughs> if, <laughs> if if we can find the same sort of businesses that aren't as capital intensive, we we've got capital. I mean, it, it, we we're ideally positioned for capital intensive businesses that other people have trouble raising capital for, but they've still got to promise decent returns. All right, this question comes from Charlie Wang. He's a shareholder in San Francisco. He says, given the unprecedented time of the economy and the debt level, could there be any risks and consequences of the U.S. government defaulting on its bonds? No. The, uh, if, you, if you print bonds in your own currency, what happens to the currency is it can be a question. But you don't default. Uh, and uh, the United States uh, has been smart enough, been the, and people have trusted us enough to issue its debt in our, its own currency. And Argentina is now having a problem because the, the debt isn't in the, their own currency, and, and lots of countries have had that problem, and lots of countries will have that problem in the future. It is very painful to owe money in somebody else's currency. But if you, listen, if I could issue a currency, Buffett bucks, and I had a printing press, uh, and um, I could borrow money, and I could borrow money in that, I would never default. <laughs> uh, so what you end up getting in terms of purchasing power can be in doubt. But in terms of the U.S. government, I... When Standard & Poor's downgraded the United States government, uh, I think it was Standard & Poor's uh, some years back, that to me uh, did not make sense. I mean, the, in the end, uh, how you can regard any corporation as stronger than the, a person who can print the money to pay you, uh, I just don't understand. Uh, so don't worry about the government defaulting. I think it's kind of crazy, incidentally. This should be said. To have these limits on the debt and all of that sort of thing and then stop the government arguing about whether it's going to increase the limits. We're going to increase the limits on the debt. The debt isn't going to be paid. It's going to be refunded. And anybody that thinks they're going to bring down the national debt, I mean, that, that you know, there's been brief periods in, uh, I think it was in the late 90s or thereabouts, uh, when the debts come down a little bit, the country's going to print more debt. It's going to, and interestingly, the country's going to grow in terms of its its debt paying capacity. And uh, but the trick is to keep borrowing in your own currency. Hmm. 
emphasis on the <laughs> trick. Um, this question comes from David Cass. He is a, a clinical professor of finance at the University of Maryland, and he says, uh, Berkshire has invested in many companies with stock buyback programs. Recently, there's been a backlash against buybacks. What are your views on this subject? Well, it's very politically correct to be against buybacks now. I'm, in, in, you know, and they're going to incorporate it in the loan program. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of crazy things said on buybacks. Buybacks are so simple. I mean, it, uh, it's a way of distributing cash to shareholders. And let's just say that you and I and Greg. The three of us decide to buy an auto dealership or a McDonald's franchise or something, and we each put a million dollars in, you know, or whatever the number may be. And we get along with each other, and the business grows and all of that. And one of us really wants to spend our share of the earnings. Uh, and the other two want to leave the money in the business to grow. Uh, now, if the three of us did that, and we only, we're the only shareholders, we would not establish a 100% dividend payout for everybody, and we wouldn't freeze the one that wanted to get out either. The logical thing to do is to buy a portion, whatever that person wants to spend annually from the earnings, buy a portion of their stock, and the other two find their interest in the company goes up, and the third person still has a little more of an interest by what they they leave in, but they also can take some money out of the business. You're, you're taking money out of the business in, the, in either case, and one, you call dividends, and you send it to everybody whether they want it or not, and with buybacks, you give it to the ones who want the money, and I have been following a policy of giving away stock now since 2006, and I'll give away a lot of stock, but the people, the, the philanthropies that, that receive it uh, the gifts have to spend the money uh, very promptly within, you know, on a current basis, more or less. So they are getting $3 billion worth of stock or whatever it may be, and I'm, in effect, reducing my interest in Berkshire, but I'm still, Berkshire's still retaining more capital than I'm giving away, so, so I have more dollars invested, but my interest goes down, and the people that need the cash to carry out the philanthropic efforts, they cash out the stock. And I don't force, I don't force my sister or whoever it may be to take a bunch of money she doesn't want. She wants it reinvested, all of it reinvested in the business. And people that, that uh, don't want to can sell some of their stock. And uh, the company ends up in the same position. We've distributed some of the capital that we don't need for growth. Now, whether the company should buy it depends on a couple of things. One is they ought to ha retain the money they need for intelligent growth prospects. That's fine. And secondly, and this is a point that's never mentioned, they should be buying it back below what they think it's worth. Now, they'll make mistakes in that, but you make mistakes in a lot of business decisions, but over that should be the guiding principle. And to my knowledge, uh, J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon said it, once and we've said it various times you know we retain st we, we 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 will repurchase shares when it's to the advantage of the continuing shareholder to have us do so but you read about all these buyback programs they say we're going to spend five billion buying it back or ten billion well that's like saying i'm going to go out and buy some business this year for five billion without knowing what you're going to get for the money it, it it should be price sensitive obviously it should be needs sensitive obviously but when the conditions are right, it should also be obvious to repurchase shares, and there shouldn't be the slightest taint to it any more than there is to dividends. And people that have now sort of taken up the cries about how terrible it was that companies bought back stock, well, you can say it was terrible for them to pay dividends, too, that they'd have more money now. But they were doing what was intelligent at the time, and I hope they continue to do what's intelligent as they go forth. Greg? Mm -hmm. No, I, the only thing I know you've commented on in the past, Warren, is that I think the one thing we are seeing, and obviously we're supportive of, of uh, buybacks, but there are companies that used probably their financial engineering was just a little uh, 
extreme. <laughs> extreme and too cute that effectively you're using every ounce of your balance sheet to buy back stock at a time where you're really creating no cushion for your business uh, for any type of event or bump in the road. And I, you know, we're going to see that. And I think that's a very unfortunate outcome of them. And hence you get some of the backlash. But there's still companies, as you highlighted, many that do it right. Yeah. Now, if they're buying it back because it's fashionable, because they really do like the idea. There's nothing wrong with doing taking an action that increases the value of the remaining shares. But if they're doing it very, and, I, and incidentally, I've been witness to some programs where it really is stupid. Uh, but I don't think it's immoral. I just think it's stupid, you know, basically. Uh, and on the other hand, I, we favor companies that take care of all their requirements for growth and as Greg says, maintain sound balance sheets and all of that. Leave a margin of error for things that you can get surprised with. And if they find their stock selling below the, mm -hmm. what they, the business is intrinsically worth, uh, I think that they're making a big mistake if they don't buy in their stock. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's gonna be a political football. And like I say, that when, when it becomes politically correct to do something in this country, the, if you're a politician, the best thing to do is get on board. But but it, Berkshire is going to do what it thinks makes sense for shareholders. And we and we like investing in companies that think that way too. And not all companies yeah. obviously do. Yeah. All right. Here's a question from Lou Bogart, uh, Lou Bogart in Boca Raton, Florida. He says. I'm a longtime shareholder with a concern as I head into retirement. I understand the theory that splitting shares does nothing for the value of shares. However, with the extremely high price on A shares, when I wish to draw down some money on, on my portfolio in retirement, I'm facing a large tax hit. Say the average price has been about $300,000 this year, and I'm sitting on a $200,000 capital gains liability for each share. If I need $60,000 in additional cash during my retirement, I need to sell a full share and get hit with $200,000 tax liability. If you would split the stock 10 for one, I could sell two $30,000 shares and keep my tax liability at a more manageable 40,000. I could also maintain more of my investment in Berkshire. Um, he said, have you thought about this? In retrospect, I should have bought B shares, but didn't think of well, that at the time. You can convert A to B shares, which is exactly what takes place when I give away the money in July to the five foundations. They, I, I actually convert it uh, immediately before the gift. I mean, it, and so they get B shares. And the truth is the B shares are very useful uh, to people that want to either give away a small portion of what they have or, 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 or spend it or whatever it may be. So you can convert the A to B shares, which is exactly what I've been doing now for for 14 years uh, as I give it away and and uh, and solve that problem and and we we uh, split the B shares as I remember at one point you know just to make it even more manageable so that people could deal with smaller denominations the B shares the A shares have a different voting power but but we passed some resolution some time ago I think and it certainly would be the case in any event we're never going to give the A shares an advantage over the B. They used to have an advantage in, in a shareholder designated contribution program that we had, and we put that in there when we started. But but that's an that goes way back in time, and that doesn't exist anymore. So that the B and the A are going to get treated exactly the same over time. It's true the A have more votes, but the and and they sell. They, they sell very close to parity all the time. So I, I would say that uh, if you if you want to do anything in terms of raising cash and you've got a lot of A shares, you know, you take one or two shares of A and, and plenty of people I know have done this and just cash in and turn it into B and, and give yourself whatever amount of cash you want to get. This uh, is one that comes from Thomas Lin in Taiwan. He says, Warren once said that banking is a good business if you don't do dumb things on the asset side. Uh, given that the pandemic might put a lot of pressure on the loans, dumb things that got done in the past few years are likely to explode. Through reading annual reports, 10 Qs, and other public information, what clues are you looking for to decide whether a bank is run by a true banker who avoids doing well, dumb things? Uh, that's, that's a very good question, but I would say that the one thing that 
made Chairman Powell's a job a little easier this time than it was in 2008-9 is that the banks are in far better shape. So in terms of thinking about what was good for the economy, he wasn't at the same time worrying about what he was going to do with Bank A or Bank B to uh, merge them with somebody else or put strain, add his trains on the system or anything. I mean, the banks, the banks were very involved uh, with the problem in 2008 and 9. They had they had done some things they shouldn't have done in some of them, and and they were certainly in far different financial condition than now. So that that uh, the banking system is not the problem. In this particular show, I mean, the, the government is. We decided as a as a people to shut down part of the part of the economy in, in a big way, and it was not the fault of anyone uh, th that it happened. Uh, things do happen in this world. Earthquakes happen. You know, it, uh, uh, huge hurricanes happen. This was something different, but. Uh, the the banks uh, the banks need regulation. I mean, you know, they benefit from the FDIC, but part of part of having the government standing behind your deposits is is uh, to behave well. And I think that the banks have behaved very well, and I think they're in in very good shape. I mean, it. Uh, that's that's how why the FDIC has built up a hundred billion dollars that I've talked about. I mean, mm -hmm. they've assessed the banks uh, in recent years at, at at accelerated amounts in certain periods, and they even differentiated against the big banks. Uh, so they built up great reserves uh, there, and they built their own balance sheets, and they are not presently part of Chairman Powell's problem, whereas they were very much part of Chairman Bernanke's problem back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, how you spot the people that are doing the dumb things uh, is not easy because, well, sometimes it's easy, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, uh, I, don't, I don't see a lot that bothers me, but banks are, in the end, institutions that operate with significant amounts of other people's money and if problems become severe enough in an economy even strong banks can be under a lot of stress and we'll be very glad we've got the federal reserve system uh, standing behind them i don't see special problems in the banking industry now i could think of possibilities and jamie diamond referred to this a little bit in the morgan jp morgan report you can dream of scenarios that puts a lot of strain on banks, and they're not totally impossible, and that's why we have a Fed. Uh, and I think that, I think overall the banking system is not gonna be the problem. But I'm not a, I, I wouldn't say that with 100% certainty because there are certain possibilities that exist in this world where banks could have problems. They're going to have problems with energy loans. Mm -hmm. They're going to have problems. Some, you know, they're going to have extra problems with consumer credit. They're going to, have, you know, they're in, but they know it, and they're well reserved. Well, they're 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 they're, they're well capitalized for it. They were reserve building in the first quarter, and they may need to build more reserves, but uh, they are not a primary worry of mine at all. We own a lot of banks, or we own a lot of bank stocks. Greg, do you have any thoughts on it? No, I really, uh, you touched on it earlier too, just in general, which is we don't know how long this pandemic will go. We don't know if there's going to be a second event, which are just risks that are really unknown at this time, and the banks will have to continue to manage through that as the uh, businesses do. But you've already uh, highlighted that, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, this question, I was looking for one of these because I got several questions that came in similar to this. I was looking for one of these a moment ago. This one's from Andrew Wenke. 
He says, can you ask Warren why he didn't purchase, repurchase Berkshire shares in March when they dropped to a price that was 30% 30, 30 lower than the price that he had repurchased shares for in January and February? Yeah, uh, it was very, very, very short period where they were 30% less. But, but uh, we, I don't think Berkshire shares relative to uh, present value are at a significantly different a discount than they were when we were paying somewhat higher prices. I mean, it, uh, you know, it's like Kane said or whoever it was, it, you know, if the facts change, I, I change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? You know, it, it's, uh, so, uh, uh, it's, we always think about it, but I don't feel that it's more, far more compelling to buy Berkshire shares now than I would have felt three months or six months or nine months ago. It's always, it's always a possibility, uh, and we'll see what happens. Greg, you've, you think about repurchasing shares? Uh, I mean, generally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I, I think your approach warns the right approach. I mean, you're always. I, I can't really add anything other than the the approach is the right approach. We approach it when we see uh, it's the right thing for for our shareholders to be repurchasing, and that doesn't mean we're repurchasing all the time, or or the view doesn't change. Well, there could be a price relative to the value at the time, not relative to what it was worth a year ago. I mean, the value of certain things have decreased. Our airline position was a mistake. Berkshire is worth less today because I took that position than if I hadn't. And there, there are other decisions like that. And uh, they're not, you know, it, it, it is not more compelling to buy the shares now than it was when we were buying them. It's not, it's not less compelling. I mean, it's, it's a wash, but we didn't do any, we, it's not gotten, it, it, the price has not gotten to a level or not been at a level where it really feels way better to us than other things, including the option value of money uh, to step up in a big, big way. Um. This question comes from three investors in Israel, Lidar Zluf, Yossi Zluf, and Dan Gorfung. They want to know about the credit card industry. It says, how do you explain the rise in the average credit card interest rate in recent years compared to the federal funds rate? What are the forces that you think might keep it at or around current levels, and what are the forces that might drive it lower in the future? Well, I, that, is, that is not a subject that I'm, you know, obviously it, it, affects American Express to some degree, it affects the banks we own, but 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 interest rates on credit cards respond to competition, obviously, to uh, loss potential, which obviously has gone up significantly in the last few months, although it's gone down perhaps from some other periods you can pick in the past, but I don't really have much I can bring to the party on that question. I it, uh, We are not in the well, that isn't true. Uh, our our furniture companies, uh, a couple of them have their own credit card, although they do a lot of business on other people's credit cards. My general advice to people: I mean, uh, you know, we we have an interest in in credit cards, but but people, uh, I I don't I think people should should avoid using credit cards as a you know as as a piggy bank to be raided. I, I had a woman come to see me here not long ago, and she'd come on a, some money, and uh, uh, not not very much, but it was a lot to her. And uh, she's a friend of mine, and she uh, she said, "What should I do with it?" You know, and and I said, "Well, what do you owe on your credit card?" And uh, uh, she says, "Well, I own X," and. Uh, uh, I said, well, what you should do, I, I, I don't know what interest rate she was paying, but I think, you know, may, I think I asked her and she knew and she, it was something like 18% or something. I said, I don't know how to make 18%. You know, I mean, uh, if, I, if I owed any money at 18%, the first thing I'd do with any, any money I had would be to pay it off. It's going to be way better than any investment idea I've got. And that wasn't what she wanted to hear. Uh, 
And then later on in the conversation, she talked about her daughter, and her daughter had a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or something, and and she said, "Well, what should I do with?" And she named the girls, uh, money, and I said, "Haber lend it to you." You know, and, and, and I mean, if you're willing to pay 18 percent or whatever, I mean, she's not going to find a better deal. I'll lend you money. It, 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 it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. You, you can't go through life, uh, you know, borrowing money at, at, at those rates and, and be better off the thing. So I I encourage everybody. It's, it's contrary to my own or Berkshire's interest in certain cases but and the world is is in love with credit cards but but i uh would suggest to anybody that the first thing they do in life is is not on i don't think they, they can get to something else later on but but don't be paying don't be paying even 12 percent to anybody i mean it's uh uh pay that off and then and uh uh and if they're really a good credit and they don't want to do it, come and see me personally. I'll lend you the money <laughs> at that rate. Greg, what do you tell your children? <laughs> no, same advice. Excellent advice. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I have three that uh, uh, carefully use their credit card. Uh, more, I would say, for uh, not, not the... Uh, obviously, people use it a lot more as they go into the digital world and, and e-commerce world, but then the goal has to be to repay it. It doesn't mean you, um, because you have to use it for those type of transactions, you you run up the balance, but th th there's an incremental risk there now. It's a matter of convenience for yeah. some people, yeah. but but uh, I would I, I would have trouble exp uh, if, if I were paying 12% for money or whatever it might be, uh, it would not be a good thing. <laughs> You won't see Berkshire paying that. <laughs> Back. Uh, Warren, this question is from Lindsay Schumacher. She, well, oh, did you have something I, we, you were saying? We probably ought to wind this up maybe in 15 minutes. Can, can you select the best ones? <laughs> okay, absolutely. Yeah, well, we, I've got sure. a couple more uh, questions for you. This one's from Lindsay Schumacher. She, she's, she says, Warren, is, what's your opinion regarding the payroll protection plan? Well, I, I don't want to get into politics generally, but I, I think that's a very good idea to take, par take care of the people that are having terrible troubles taking care of themselves in a period like this. I mean, if the government and surrounding conditions and whatever it may be, if you're, if you're telling a lot of, of businesses essentially, you know, quit doing business for a long time. And uh, it's one thing to tell me, but, but to tell somebody that's living from paycheck to paycheck that way, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm all for it. it. It must be hell to administer. I mean, it, you know, the, any huge problem. I don't, I don't want to, I'll never get into criticizing on how people do this or that because I've had problems myself in running a few big things. Uh, it, it just isn't that easy to inaugurate incredibly large problems. There's going to be a certain amount of fraud. There's going to be, a, a, you know, everything doesn't go perfectly, but I am 100% uh, for taking care of the people that that uh, really get hurt by something that they've got nothing to do with and it, uh, and where it's, you know, who knows, who knows how long it lasts. It's, you've got millions and millions of people that are worrying about something that they weren't worried about a few months ago, and they didn't do anything. They showed up for work on time, and they they pleased the people they dealt with, and whatever it may have been. And now they don't have a job, and uh, uh, or they've been furloughed, or whatever. So I I'm, I'm I'm totally for the basic idea, and I think it's very difficult. You can't carry it out perfectly. You do your best, and you do it promptly. And I I give uh, I. I, I, I give real credit, you know, to both Congress for acting promptly on what the problem is. They've, they've sort of caught on from what they learned in 2008 and 9, I think. Uh, and I give credit uh, 
to trying to do what I think is very much the right thing, and I don't sit around and think about how I could do it better. Greg? No, I, I agree with the comments. Uh, Warren, this question comes from Bill Murray, the actor, who's also a shareholder in Berkshire. He says, this pandemic will graduate a new class of war veterans, healthcare, food supply, deliveries, community services. So many owe so much to these few. How might this great country take our turn and care for all of them? Well, uh, we won't be able to pay, actually. Uh, you know, it's like people that landed in Normandy or something. I mean, the, the poor, the disadvantaged, they suffer. You know, there's an unimaginable suffering, and at the same time, they're doing all these things that, you know, they're working 24-hour days, and, and we don't even know their names. Uh, you know, so we ought to do a, if we go overboard on something, we ought to do things that can help those people. And this country, I've said it a lot of times before, but the history of it, I mean, we are a rich, rich, rich country. And uh, uh, the people that are doing the kind of work that Bill talks about, uh, you know, they are, they're contributing a whole lot more than some of the people that came out of the right womb, you know, or got lucky and things, or know how to arbitrage bonds or whatever it may be. And I'm, you know, in a large part, I'm one of those guys. Uh, so you, you really try to create a society that under normal conditions with more than $60,000 of GDP per capita that anybody that works 40 hours a week uh, can have a decent life without a second job and with a couple of kids and have, you know, they can't live like kings, I don't mean that, but that nobody should be left behind. It's like a rich family, you know, you find rich families and if they have five heirs or six heirs, you know, they try and pick maybe the most able one to run the business, and the, but they don't, they don't forget about you know, the, the kid that actually may be a better citizen in some ways even than the one that does the best at business, but it just doesn't happen, happen to have market value skills. So I, I, uh, I do not think that a very rich company ought to totally abide by, totally abide by what the market dishes out, you know, in 18th century style or something of the sort. So uh, I've... I, I welcome ideas that go in that direction. I, we've gone in that direction. You know, we did come up with Social Security in the in the in the 30s. We we've made some progress, but but we ought to. I mean, it, uh, uh, it, we have become very 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 rich as a country, and uh, we've been things have improved for for the bottom 20 percent. I mean, uh, you can see st various statistics on that, but they. I'd rather be in the, I'd rather be in the bottom 20% now than be in the bottom 20% 100 years ago or 50 years ago. But, but it's what's really improved is the top 1%. And uh, I hope we as a country move in a direction where people Bill's talking about get treated better, and it isn't going to hurt. It isn't going to hurt the country's growth and. and uh, uh, it's overdue, but a lot of things are overdue. We are, we, I, I will still so, say we're a better society than we were 100 years ago, but you would think with our prosperity, we could, we would hold ourselves to a, even higher standards of taking care of our fellow man, particularly when you see a situation like you've got today where it's the people that, whose names you don't know that are watching the people come in and watching the bodies go out. Greg? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, the, the, the only other group that I would highlight, I think it's, it'll be very interesting to see how it plays out is uh, with the number of homeschooling and the children that are home, I think there's a, uh, we've always had so much respect for our teachers, but we all talk about how we don't take care of them. And 
Uh, you know, it is remarkable to hear how many people comment that clearly we don't recognize or, you know, I have a little eight-year-old Beckett at home and, you know, plenty of challenges for mom, but all of a sudden you respect the institution, the school, the teachers and everything around it. So there's, and then when I think of our companies and the delivery employees we have, it's absolutely amazing what they're doing and, and they're truly on the front line. You know, that's where we have our, our challenges around keeping them health and safety. And then you go all the way to the rail. Uh, the best videos you see out of our companies are when we have folks that are actively engaged in moving supplies, food, medical products and and they're so proud of it and they recognize they're making a difference so a lot of it is uh we just owe them a great thanks and you know warren you touched on it we can some way maybe hopefully longer term compensate them but there's a a great deal of thanks and i probably just think an immense amount new uh uh appreciation for a variety of folks <laughs> we're going the right direction all yeah. around the country but it's yeah. been awfully slow Um, gentlemen, I'll make this the last question. It comes from Phil King. He says, many people in the press and politics are questioning the validity of capitalism. What can you say to them that might prompt them to take a look at capitalism more favorably? Well, the market system works wonders, and it's also brutal if left entirely to itself. And we wouldn't be the country we are if the market system hadn't been allowed to function. And to some extent, you can say that other countries around the world that have improved their way of life dramatically, to some extent, have, have, have copied us. So the, the, the market system is marvelous uh, in many respects, but it needs government. And uh, it, it uh, you know, it is creative destruction, but, for the ones who are destroyed, it can be it can be a very brutal game, and and for the people who work in the industries and all of that sort of thing. So I, I, I do not want to come up with anything different than capitalism, but I certainly do not want unfettered capitalism, and and uh, uh, it's I don't think we'll move away from it, but I. I think we capitalists, I'm one of them, you know, I think there's a lot of thought that should be given to what would happen if we all drew straws, again, for particular market-based skills. Uh, you know, it's somewhere, somewhere way back, somebody invented television, I don't know who it was, and 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 then they invented cable, then they invented pay systems and all of that. And so a fellow that could bat 406 in 1941 was worth $20,000 a year and now a marginal a big leaguer, you know, will make vastly greater sums because in effect the stadium size was increased from 30 or 40 or 50,000 people to the country and the market system, capitalism took over. And it's very uneven. And instantly, I think that Ted Williams is worth a whole lot more money than I've ever uh, should make. Uh, but the, the market system can work toward a winner takes all type situation. And uh, we don't want to discourage people from working hard and thinking hard, but that alone doesn't do it. There's a, there is a, a lot of randomness in the capitalist system, in, including inherited wealth. And uh, I think we can, I think we can keep the best parts of a market system and capitalism, and we can do a better job of making sure that everybody participates in the prosperity that that produces. Greg? Yeah. No, I, I think it's always keeping the best parts of it. And I even think if if we look at the current environment we're in, uh, i.e. in the pandemic, and we have to do it only when we can do it properly and, and, and reemerge. But in some ways, the best opportunity for people is when we're back working clearly and that the system's functioning again. But that 
that that's that's the obvious and then there's as Warren you've highlighted there's you know there's a lot of imperfections but it's still uh, uh, it's definitely the best model out there uh, that just needs some fine-tuning and Becky at the end I would just yeah, hey, yeah, Warren, I, I, I would just say that you know I, oh sure can go I ahead. Just can I can I just slip sure. in one more quick question Absolutely. I forgot this one someone sent it in earlier Thanks. Anderson Haxton wrote in. He said, Warren mentioned that Ben Graham is one of the three smartest people he's ever met. I'd like to ask him the names of the other two. Well, I, I may not be one of the smartest, but I'm smart enough not to name the other two. I'd make two people happy. In them. But, but I would, it isn't, a, Ben Graham is one of the three smartest people. And I, I've known some really smart people. Uh, uh, smartness is not necessarily um, uh, does not necessarily equate to wisdom uh, either. And Ben Graham, one of the things he said he liked to do every day was he wanted to do something creative, something generous, and something foolish. And uh, he said he was pretty good at the latter. <laughs> but he was pretty good. He was amazing, actually, at the creative. But, but uh, it's, it's interesting that... IQ does not always translate into rationality and, and uh, behavioral success or wisdom. And so I, uh, I know some people that are extraordinarily wise that would not be in the top three on an IQ test. But if I wanted their judgment on some matter, uh, even if I want to put them in a position of responsibility someplace, I might prefer them to... So we'll say one of the three. That'll leave the other two feeling fine. <laughs> of the three, <laughs> Greg, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, I, 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 I agree with uh, the person you named. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Becky, I would, I would just, I, I would just say again uh, that uh, we may have. I hope we don't, but we, we may get some unpleasant surprises. And, and, and um, we are dealing with a virus that that. Uh, that that spreads its wings in a certain way, you know, in very un, unpredictable ways, and how the how the how the how Americans react to it, I, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities. But I definitely come to the conclusion after weighing all that sort of stuff, never bet against America. So thanks. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate okay. your time tonight. And we'll see you next year and we'll have we'll fill this place. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night everybody. Night.